If you're just joining us, welcome to Critical Connections live from Congress. We're about to start our first live broadcast of the day, sepsis, a threat that needs a global solution. I'm joined as always by your Critical Connections live co-hosts, Dr. Chris Carroll and Dr. Ludwig Lin, as well as Doc Dr. Tex Kassoon, who is a world leader in children's sepsis and has worked extensively in resource limited nations. Dr. Kassoon, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, Andrea. Are you excited pleased to, to be, be here? here. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. <laughs> Please introduce yourself, yeah. if you will. Well, um, I'm Tex Kassoon. I'm from the University of British Columbia. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Global Sepsis Alliance and vice chair um, of World Sepsis Day, and also co-chair of this Pediatric Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, Guideline. As Andrea said, I've worked in uh, both resource-rich and resource-poor countries. I've straddled both. Um, so I'm very excited to uh, hear this particular talk because I think this is going to be very relevant to most parts of the world. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you join us here this morning, Tex. So what are you most excited for in today's talk? Well, I've always uh, looked at sepsis uh, as a, there's a quadruple burden of sepsis. It's a political disease, a social disease, an economic disease, mm -hmm. as well as a clinical disease. And what I'm excited about, I think that this talk will encompass or uh, sort of um, give a panoramic view of all and will straddle both the issue of uh, resource rich and resource poor areas within a country um, I know uh, uh, Flavia, who will be giving this talk, is from Brazil, and um, there is this great dichotomy within Brazil itself. But also, I think that she will frame it within the global sphere as to the United Nations World Health Resolution on sepsis, which says is a global threat. So I'm quite excited to hear the broad scope of what she's going to um, discuss. Mm. So things that might work in a resource rich area of the world might not work so well in a resource limited area of the world. Absolutely. But also when we look at it, it's context specific. So uh, resources are one aspect of the entire thing, but sepsis also, the burden of sepsis has also a um, different sort of psychological overlay. So in many parts of the world where HIV and AIDS is a major problem, that has a social stigma that is attached to it that is different from sepsis in other areas. More so sepsis in children is different. We look at it and think, well, uh, with children, the issue of sepsis is not self-inflicted, but adults it may have something to do with lifestyle issues and those things. So I think it's... Uh, the context is different in different parts of the world. The resources are different. The approaches are different. And I think that this is what is exciting about it, the opportunities that are bound in making changes. I wanted to follow up on that. I, I, I practice in the United States. ICU care is expensive in the United sure. States. Sepsis gets a lot of attention, but it also gets a lot of technology. But a resource-rich society taking care of a problem doesn't necessarily have a higher success rate in treating that particular disease. And uh, other factors like efficiency, ingenuity also come into play. You've traveled a lot, you've seen a lot. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about this. Absolutely. In fact, you heard um, the new president, uh, Jerry Zimmerman, yesterday, and you're wearing the buttons, less is more. I yes, think that, were hard that, to get. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that plays into exactly what I'm going to say. I've just came back from Sudan, and I can tell you that Sudan is a country with uh, very uh, limited resources, but they have leapfrogged many countries in the world, including Germany, UK, United States, etc., in their approach to the entire process. Because remember, sepsis is not only something that ends up in an ICU, when someone ends up in an ICU, it's failure of uh, upstream events. So for instance, uh, the precursors to sepsis are things like looking at vaccination rates, uh, vaccine preventable diseases. We have um, hygiene issues, sanitation issues, nutrition issues. They are all, and a good public health sort of grounding, they all play into the issue of sepsis that goes upstream to ICU. So this isn't really something that we would traditionally think about having a discussion about at an intensive care meeting, things like vaccine rates and clean water and, uh, yeah. and good public health. No, and I think that uh, we, sh we should start. If we look at uh, the evidence in Brazil, a few years ago we did a study looking at pediatric sepsis in Brazil. And the, the pediatric sepsis, uh, there were about 70,000 visits in-hospital visits in Brazil over about a 10-year period. 
Uh, over that period of time, the government put nutrition programs, hygiene programs, sanitation programs, mm -hmm. and the number of uh, patients um, admitted decreased to 30, uh, 35,000, so 50% decrease wow. in this sort of thing and wow. when you have limited resources you have to go upstream well that, that's almost it gets to your point Ludwig about the the money the um, it seems like investments in uh, in non ICU care might have more bang for your buck uh, than uh, than than some of these other uh, more intensive care therapies. Absolutely. In fact, when we look at it across the board, uh, there uh, is a lot of literature written on the decimation of public health um, right. across the world. And it's public health that really b bolsters the care, resilient healthcare systems. Right. This seems to me analogous to how the, um, the surgeons have gotten very involved in uh, safety and trauma prevention. Yep. It seems like that intensivists need to be more involved in public health um, and the political aspects of why someone gets sepsis if we're going to achieve that goal of reducing sepsis deaths by a million. Absolutely. And I think that uh, we are all members of society in general also. We have to have the fiduciary responsibility not only to our individual patients, but to how resources are deployed. We are the leaders in the field. And the fact is that um, while it's in the DNA of physicians or clinicians to uh, uh, be the advocates for the individual patients, I think as leaders you have to advocate for the population in general also. Yeah, not, not just the patient at your bedside is your patient. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. Well, with that, we are very excited knowing more about you and your background and looking forward to that discussion, certainly. We're going to cut to the live session as soon as it begins at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gloria Rodriguez Vega. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning Max Harry Wilde's Memorial Lecture Award recipient, Dr. Flavia Machado. Dr. Machado is professor and chair of the intensive care in the pain, anesthesiology, and intensive care department at the Federal University at Sao Paulo, Brazil. She is currently the scientific director for the Asociado Brasileira de Medicina Intensiva, AMIB. She is also a member of the executive committee of the Brazilian Research and Intensive Care Network, BRICNET, and also one of the founders and currently the CEO of the Latin American Sepsis Institute a nonprofit organization devoted to awareness raising, quality improvement, and coordination of multi-center trials in sepsis. She is a member of the executive board of the Global Sepsis Alliance, served on the 2012 and 2016 board of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, and if that isn't enough, she is also a member of the International Sepsis Forum Council. Please join me in welcoming Flavia as she receives the Max Harry Wilde Memorial Lecture Award and presents Sepsis, a threat that needs a global solution. And to facilitate the conversation around this topic, um, we are tweeting this session and it's hashtag surviving sepsis, hashtag SCCM live. Flavia? Thank you so much. Good morning. Some years ago, this man died in my ICU. I left my hospital and went home because he was the husband of my maid, a lovely woman called Denise that is working with me for the last 20 years, raising my kids, taking care of my home. When I arrived home in the middle of the morning, it was needless to say anything. We start crying. He died from septic shock, and his death was a preventable one. One among millions, millions of deaths that this planet pays to sepsis every year. How many deaths? We don't know. Our best estimates came from this systematic review 
done by Caroline Fretman that works with Conrad Heinhardt. Revising the literature, they found 27 studies coming from seven high-income countries. A incidence of 260 cases per year, per 100,000 patient uh, habitant years, and a mortality rate of 26%. It's from this systematic review that we take all the numbers that we use in our awareness campaigns. Six million deaths. However, there is a mathematical problem here. There are 78 high-income countries harboring 1.2 billion lives, where, whereas there are 140 low- and middle-income countries harboring 6.2 billion lives, which means that we should expect 86% of all sepsis cases in the world happening on low- and middle-income countries. But it's not only a mathematical problem. We do have the disparity problem. And just a glance on these slides will show you my point. This is the percentage of GDP spent in health. This is the healthcare access and quality index done by GBDR project. This is mortality, under five mortality. This is data coming from INEC. This is a consortium comprising more than 50 low and middle income countries more than 800,000 patients, and they report healthcare-associated infections. As, as you can see, the numbers coming from these low-resource settings are completely different from the numbers coming from the US. And how about prevention? Pneumococcus vaccination. These are the lines for the high-income countries. This is the lines for low- and middle-income countries that are covered by a program called Gavi, a alliance, an international alliance that provides vaccination. And this is the line for the middle-income countries that are not eligible for Gavi. So from this, we can easily depict that we cannot estimate world numbers based on high-income country data. But from the other side, the issue is that we do not have quality data coming from low- and middle-income countries. These are the very few studies, multi-centered studies, coming from low-resource settings. But we can see from here that the mortality rates are much higher than the 26% found in the systematic review. And there are four studies coming from Brazil that also show much higher mortality rates. However, these studies are not good quality ones. Last year, we had the opportunity to see two very nice studies coming from our settings. One coming from China. These guys revised 21,000 charts in Beijing and they found a mortality rate of 54%. And in Brazil, we published last year in Lancet Infectious Disease, the SPREAD study, a one-day prevalence study in 227 Brazilian ICUs, a random sample of 15% of all Brazilian ICUs, both public and private. And what we found, an estimated incidence of 290 cases per 100,000 patient inhabitants, which is higher than the systematic review, and we are talking only about ICU-treated incidents and a mortality rate of 55%. So what we can see from the here is that the 6 million deaths per year is a gross underestimation of the size of the burden of sepsis in our, our planet. Another problem is that we cannot compare low- and middle-income countries with high-income countries. This is not like comparing peers with apples. And actually, we, LMICs, we are not apples. 
we are much more like a whole fruit salad because we are different among each other. And why do we need these numbers? We need these numbers because we need to have people committed. We need to sensitize all healthcare planners, all budget planners, all people that are, uh, have influential roles in the healthcare system. We need to sensitize them that self sepsis is a global healthcare issue. And how are we not going to get these numbers? Sincerely speaking, in the short term, I think we need some specialized help, and only Hogwarts can help us at this moment. But in the middle term, or in the long term, there are some solutions. First, we can and we need better ICD codes and better ICD coding practices, because we do not use what we have. And we need better clinical definitions of sepsis, and we will be back on this in a minute. Global Burden of Disease Report. As you know, GBDR, uh, they only use uh, the underlying cause of death, and they only use the baseline infectious disease process as underlying cause of death. Sepsis is treated in the GBD uh, uh, reports as a garbage code and it is reassigned for the infectious disease uh, baseline uh, uh, cause, which under, underscores uh, this, the burden of sepsis, as it is not reported as sepsis. But the good news is that there is a new project in GBDR, which is run by Christina Rudd uh, to, in the uh, University of Washington with the uh, GBDR project, together with uh, University of Pittsburgh, Global Sepsis Alliance, and uh, other people. And um, the aim of this project is to estimate both incidence, prevalence, morbidity, mortality of sepsis based not only in the underlying cause of death, but in the intermediate and in the immediate cause of death. However, there are only few countries in the world that report this intermediate cause of deaths. However, but this will be enough to model and to estimate uh, uh, the numbers of, of, of sepsis cases worldwide. This is very important because it would be one of the first disease in the GBDR project uh, to uh, analyze this intermediate cause of deaths, and we hope to have these first results very soon. We also need to have better electronic uh, charts because this will give us uh, clinical information. However, this is a problem because, as you know, uh, electronic charts are available only uh, in middle-income countries and in high-income countries. But even in middle-income countries, they are restricted to, to the best hospitals and they give us a biased information about our countries. So I would say that in the long term, the best solution is certainly to build research capacity in middle-income income countries and low-income countries. And we will have the help of WHO because WHO will start to monitor uh, sepsis all worldwide and this will certainly help in the future. Certainly, there are a lot of factors that affect uh, related to the host, to the pathogen, and to the healthcare system that affects both incidence and mortality of sepsis. And as this is not standardized in all these studies and in all these reports, this certainly precludes uh, the comparison between studies and uh, the data assess assessment. However, uh, it's not only the issue of not getting good data. The issue here is that these factors really affect what we need, which is to reduce sepsis mortality rates. And going back to what Martin Luther King said on 1966, from all sorts of inequality, it's certainly injustice in health, the most shocking and inhumane. He was not referring to sepsis, but his quote, certainly fits well on this disease, because disparities are present in most of the factors that affect uh, mortality. Disparities, uh, although highly weighted towards the, the low and middle income countries, uh, plagues the delivery of care everywhere. 
We are in the most powerful nation of the world, and I'm sure that you face disparities in your daily practices. As it, it has been nicely shown uh, also here in the United States. For instance, uh, in the underserved areas of South Carolina, mortality rates are higher. Uninsured patients have received fewer interventions, have shorter ICU and hospital stays, and have higher mortality rates. Some researchers have already demonstrated that at least partially racial disparities might be explained by the fact that black people are admitted in hospitals with lower quality of care. And also, socioeconomic status measured by the mean income uh, has been associated with uh, higher mortality rates, not only in the US, but also in Denmark. But certainly, disparities are much present between high-income countries and low-income countries. And going back to Alvaro's history, the disparities, the inadequacies of his treatment led to his death. Alvaro has been, had tuberculosis, and he was treated in one of the nicest public teaching hospitals in Sao Paulo because it was his, the referral hospital for the place where he lives in the city. One day, he woke up confused. He had fever in the day before. He was speaking nonsense. So his family brought him to the hospital, to the emergency department. After hours of waiting in a very quick interview with the ED physician, he was discharged with the diagnosis of an acute psychiatrist disorder and he was oriented to seek for an outpatient consultation with a psychiatrist. Not only, to, not only mentioning the missed diagnosis of a sepsis-induced encephalopathy, can you imagine how long does it take in my country to get a psychiatrist consultation in the public system? Months. The family took it for granted, believe it, and went home. Why? Low lay people awareness. The family never knew that a severe infection could cause confusion. And this is usual in Brazil. I'm not aware about any low and middle income country that has a survey about pe low lay people awareness. But we did it. LASI, Latin American Sepsis Institute, we uh, had this survey done by one of these big companies that do election surveys in Brazil, and we asked 2,000 people in 134 cities all around Brazil, and only 7% of the Brazilians have heard the word sepsis, although 98% of them have heard the word myocardial infarction. And these numbers are completely different from the numbers of the high-income countries. And as you can see, the rate between German and Brazil is 7 to 1, which, which brings us bad memories, by the way. <laughs> but we can change these numbers. Some years ago, Global Sepsis Alliance, as you know, launched the World Sepsis Day. And we're doing great things all around the world, including Brazil. We have a Facebook page with more than 53,000 likers. We do videos, we do cartoons, we do a lot of activities on the World Sepsis Day, not only in Brazil, but everywhere. You have here Sepsis Alliance, Robbie Stentos Foundation that are doing a great job. And these numbers are changing. As you can see here, in Brazil, last year, we repeated the survey and we have 100% improvement. And we beat the Germans. On that day, in DD, it wasn't only a problem with the family. Certainly, we have a problem with healthcare uh, professionals' knowledge, as you certainly know. We had a survey done by LASI some years ago, and half of the physicians didn't know the concept of severe sepsis 
by that time. And this would, uh, you have other examples of this. For instance, coming from Malawi, from Turkey, and also here in the US. We know that this is a huge problem, and a lot of things are being doing about this. For instance, so SCCM and ZICMI is doing a great job with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Great, great, great job. Thank you, SCCM. Thank you, ZICMI, for all what has been done about the Surviving Sepsis Campaign since 2004. But also, there are not, not other initiatives like this in Uganda, using WHO EMI Quick Check which is not only for sepsis, it's for severely ill patients. And this paper coming from Uganda has clearly shown that training physicians, uh, with training, you will be able to uh, detect these patients much earlier. Or, for instance, Alima, a nurse working on Nigeria, training nurses to detect septic patients. And us in the Global Sepsis Alliance, this is the World Sepsis Congress that we did in 2016. It's a completely web congress. We had more than 15,000 registers in the first version. All the, all the lectures are made available, freely available in the internet, and they have been accessed more than 55,000 times. And as you can see, half of the registrants were from low and middle income countries, and more than half were non-physicians. And people were like this making meetings to, ass to, to, to assist the Congress and making all the efforts to get access to the Internet. And last year, we did the Spotlight, a joint meeting with WHO. 70% of the attendees were from low and middle income countries, and again, more than half were non-physicians. This year, we are planning the Second World Congress. Uh, this is going to be, again, all web-based, more than 100 speakers from all around the world. On the next day, Ines called me. I wasn't on the city. Ines regretted until today that she didn't call me in the first day. Alvaro was not good, and I told her, bring him immediately to my hospital. I phoned the chief of the emergency department and asked him for help. I told him, I think he has sepsis. And even this, besides all this, besides the fact that I work in a university hospital and my hospital have a sepsis protocol implemented in DED, it took over much more than one hour to receive the first shot of antibiotics. He deteriorated. He was intubated in DED. He uh, needed vasopressors and mechanical ventilation. This is inadequate quality of care. On the spread study that I just showed you, we were unable to show a difference in a random sample of Brazilian intensive care units between public and private institutions. However, this is LASI database. We are training institutions in Brazil since 2005. Our database now has more than 50,000 patients, and we published the first part of it in critical, in critical care medicine last year. And as you can see, the upper line is the public institutions, and they were not able to sustain a reduction in mortality rates. And the, the line below is the, uh, from the private institutions, and they were able to reduce nicely the mortality rates. Quality improvement is the best option for resource-poor settings, and we need to detect and to know what are the barriers and what are the facilitators, because we need the line that is below and not the upper line. We don't know exactly why this happened, but there are many potential reasons. We are not treating the same population in public and private institutions in Brazil. The public system, the, the population from the public system, does not have the same quality of healthy as in the private system. And there is delay in searching for care. The emergency uh, departments are much more crowded. There is shortage of healthcare workers. There is shortage of resources and shortage of ICU beds. And we need to find this out, because we also had the opportunity to demonstrate in a subset 
of our private institutions that our implementation process is cost-saving. We are not only in these 3,000 patients on this study saving lives, we are saving money. So there is no reason why we could not apply this in many more hospitals. On that day, indeed, the Alvaro had to wait many, many hours to get an ICU bed because we didn't have any free available bed for him. This is a huge problem in Brazil because we have disparities. If you are covered by the public system, this is your map. If you are covered by the private system, this is your map. And they are completely different. And they are different inside the country. If you are in the poorest part of the country, on the north, you're going to have much less beds for you, both in the, private, uh, in, the, in the public system. So, and of course, this is a much better situation in Brazil than, for instance, in Africa. In Zambia, there is a single ICU bed with 10 beds for the whole country, for 13 million people. And we are not only talking about ICU beds, we are talking about what an ICU bed represents. Renal replacement therapy, mechanical ventilation, all the life support measures that we can offer to our patients. And we cannot, and we, we don't need to go so far. Let's talk about the first item of the sepsis bundle, lactate sample. In Uganda, 90% of the institutions never have lactate, which is true for 40% of all Africa, at least on this study. And it is true for 60% of the institutions in Mongolia. This is what we are facing in these low-resource settings. People are sharing the same oxygen and sharing this sort of ventilation equipment. And how about us, an upper-middle-income country, a rich economy like Brazil? When we did spread, we asked them, please tell us, do you have, always have, these eight items that we feel are necessary to comply with the six-hour bundle? And we consider as a lower viability institution if they have at least six of these items. And we were not surprised to see that our public institutions, 32% of them, were lower viability ones. And in our multivariated analysis, being in a lower viability institution was associated with a 2.6 higher risk of death. We, in our federal university, we are a lower viability institution. And Alvaro was with us. This leads us to the issue that low and middle resource settings, low and middle resource countries like us, we need specific guidelines. We need to think what we can do with our patients because we are different. And this also leads us to this question. In that day, in the emergency department, did Alvaro really had, have sepsis? Well, it depends. If you're using the broad sepsis tree definition, the answer is yes. Because Alvaro had a life-threatening organ dysfunction associated with a dysregulated uh, ROS response to infection. However, if you strict to the clinical definition of sepsis, the answer is no. Why? Because he had a Glasgow Coma score of 14. And a Glasgow Coma score of 14 is a SOFI score of 1. And even if his Glasgow coma was 13, it was still a SOFI score of 1. And this does not qualify him 
to the diagnosis of sepsis. And even if it wasn't a Glasgow Comi score, but rather hypotension, he would not qualify for the current definition of sepsis. Because hypotension is surface score of one. So, but okay, if his bilirubin was two, he would have sepsis. Because bilirubin of two is a surface score of two. So there is a problem with this variation in surface score of two to define sepsis. Because a big part of this planet do not have access to labs, but everyone can calculate a surface score, a, a Glasgow Coma score. And almost everyone can measure pressure. And you are under scoring the clinical manifestations of sepsis, which, by the way, based on data where exactly the ones who were selected as, as able to predict death and were put on the Q surface score, which means that makes no sense not to define sepsis by the presence of Glasgow Comi score and hypotension. Oh, you might say, no, you are making some confusion, Flavia. What is important is that the bedside a physician will see the patient and will see, oh, can treat the patient, even if it does not qualify for the definition of sepsis. And I will say, we need a definition that can be used at bedside. We need a definition that we can teach our students at bedside. And this definition is not for this. And they are saying that this definition is good for epidemiological purpose and for research. And I would say that our main objective as healthcare workers, it's not doing research and it's not doing epidemiological studies and actually is taking care of our patients at bedside. Second point. The second problem is that if this definition is good for epidemiological purpose, we do have a problem because for the definition of septic shock, we need lactate. And as I just showed to you, there are a lot of places in this planet that cannot measure lactate. So we will have problems with the epidemiological objective because we are not going to make the diagnosis of septic shock if you don't measure lactate. And the third problem is the Q-SOFA. Q-SOFA is, is a severity score. And unfortunately, there was a misunderstanding of this uh, proposal. And Q-SOFA is being used as a screening tool. As we know, severity score is chosen based on the best balance between sensitivity and specificity. And to use something as a screening tool uh, in a deadly disease like sepsis, we do need a uh, tool that has much more sensitivity. And a lot of papers have been already showing that uh, QSOFA has low sensitivity, and we do show that this is unpublished data coming from LASI database. We asked our institutions to collect prospectively QSOFA before the diagnosis of sepsis, meaning patients with organ dysfunction according to the definition of the surviving sepsis campaign. And we have data from 5,000 patients now. And I can tell you that 62% of these 5,000 patients are QSOFA negative. They don't have two of the three components of the QSOFA. And their mortality rate, when they are QSOFA negative, in the private institutions in Brazil, is 7 and 15%. But I already told you that the private institutions in LASI database are not translating our reality. What translates better our reality are the public institutions, which means that this is much better to translate. 34% mortality rate, with your QSOFA zero, and 40%. So at least in our settings, to use QSOFA to screen for sepsis, which will mean that you're gonna miss 62% of the patients, and they will die in 40% of the case. 
Could we have prevent Alvaro's death? That's a good question. Alvaro died less than 48 hours after being admitted to our hospital. And we isolated in his blood a pneumococcus. He had pneumonia. In Brazil, we do have a very good public uh, vaccination program, but pneumococcus vaccine is very expensive. So only those with more than 60 years old uh, have access to it, which was not the case of Alvaro. I am the mother of two teenagers, which were vaccinated when they were very young, because I paid for it. But Alvaro, he did not have this chance. Sepsis is at least partially a preventable disease. We can prevent sepsis by preventing infection. But as Jerry addressed yesterday, we also can prevent sepsis by dia diagnosis, diagnosing infection earlier. And uh, we think that we need very sensitive screening tools for that. And last but not least, if Alvaro hadn't died, would he have received support in Brazil as a survival? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Not specifically. We, we don't have in our public system anything for critical care survivals. And uh, I congratulate SCCM for the TREE program, which is now, I know, far beyond the US borders. But I also congratulate people from Uganda. They have this program, Smart Discharge, which is wonderful. The mortality rate for kids after discharge in Uganda is after 30, within 30 days of discharge is as high as in, ho in the hospital. And they developed this uh, app. They detect uh, which are the predictors for early death, and they developed this app which can detect which are the high-risk kids, and they follow these kids. And this program are uh, reducing the mortality rates uh, not very nicely. Well, all the points that I addressed here are quite important. They are fundamental in our fight against sepsis. Uh, this is certainly a threat that needs a global solution. And all these points are very important. Some years ago, Global Sepsis Alliance put together a group of uh, people uh, with the objective to get political uh, support. Our aim was to sensitize uh, healthcare ministers of many countries, because we need WHO uh, to address the sepsis issue. And on May last year, we got a new player on this game, a very strong player, a global player. As you know, on May last year, WHO approved a new resolution on prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of sepsis. And all, everything that we discussed here are addressed on this resolution. And uh, I think that this will not lead us to the victory on this war, but will certainly help us to win many of our battles. We are now lobbying WHO to get a global action plan for sepsis, uh, as we have this global action plan for antimicrobial resistance, with all the objectives, all the stakeholders, and all the roles very well defined. This might not be of utmost importance for the developed world, because you will, will develop your national action plans uh, regardless of the fact that there is a global action plan. But for the developing world, this is m m very important, because we need WHO to put our governments under pressure. I don't believe that our government, that Brazil and all the middle and low income countries will develop our own national action plans if there is no global action plan. And there are a lot of things going on. For instance, WHO had uh, uh, put a group of experts on January on Geneva to discuss all these aspects and, uh, uh, and trying to uh, settle uh, the plans for the next uh, five years. And uh, there were experts from all around the world, 
it was a quite balanced uh, uh, panel, and uh, something very interesting happened. There, there was a guy from Africa over there, and uh, there were a lot of discussion about the low resource settings, and uh, in one of the moments, in one of the workshops that I was moderating, this guy said, oh, oh, I'm sorry to go back again to this low resource setting issue. And I told him, why you are apologizing? We are 85% of the burden of sepsis. So it is expected that most part of the discussion is on us. You are an, Afri an African representative in a double HO meeting. Do not apologize. And I think that sepsis quite nicely represents the equity dilemma. Should we seek for new tools, new technology devices that will enable us to detect an infective agent a couple of hours earlier, while thousands, millions of people in the low resource settings have never heard about sepsis, and thus do not seek for care? Should we spend millions of dollars trying to find a new vasopressor while millions of people in Africa have no access to any vasopressor? All this innovation, all these tools are very costly. And even if they prove effective, it's hardly, they hardly will help the massive numbers of patients that need them. However, in terms of equity, it is equally important to improve the care for those who need in the developed world, as it is to find inexpensive therapies and new strategies of quality improvement for those who live in the resource-limiting settings. The global solution should be tracked in both directions. And the problem is that the current pathway is unbalanced on the direction of the developed world needs. And I think that WHO will help to put us on the track and to find us the balance. And we, as the communities, should help us also to find the balance. Oops. Sorry. I haven't, say, say, uh, I haven't said thanks to SCCM for inviting me on the beginning of my talk, because I wanted to say it now. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for hearing us. Our voices are not powerful ones, but they need to be heard. We don't have a lot of papers in New England or in JAMA. Some of us never publish a paper that it's in PubMed. But we are experts. We are experts in our own reality, and we are the best. Ah, we could not save Alvaro. We could not bring him back to his family. But we could save many. We could save Alexandre, that spent two months in our ICU and came back to say hello to our residents and we could save so many. And I think that we should focus our attention in transforming each of our patients in survivors. And trying to do this to every patient, to every moment in our lives. Trying to do the, a better place, trying to transform our world in a better world, forever and doing our best. And uh, certainly trying to reach uh, what is written in the, the Global Sepsis Alliance website. A world free of sepsis, a world free of preventable deaths. Thank you for your attention.
And we are back for the debrief on the session we just saw live from Congress. Again, we welcome Dr. Tex Kassoon to help us learn a little bit more about what is being done to address this major health challenge. I'll turn things over to our co-host to begin the discussion. Take it away, Dr. Carroll. Yes, that was a, that was a great talk by Dr. Machado, really inspiring. So. I wondered if you could comment a little bit on sepsis as a political issue. Sepsis is a political um, uh, disease as much as a, as a infectious disease. Sure. No, um, <coughs> no, thanks very much for that. I think when we look at sepsis in its broader sense, uh, let us talk about what Flavia said about prevention uh, is, a, is a major issue. When we look at, um, I think she was allu um, alluding to public health interventions. So for instance, better sanitation, better nutrition, better hygiene, better vaccine. That all has to have political will because public health has been sort of degraded worldwide. I think the other thing that we see, even with uh, vaccines, uh, there are sort of political implications of vaccines across the world. And I think that we have done a bad job of really uh, explaining ourselves and doing it right. For instance, in Pakistan, uh, there were uh, years ago where health workers were used to sort of um, be a political limb of the government to spy on people, etc. And that sort of uh, caused the vaccine program right. to really uh, be um, suspicion. Uh, yeah. suspicion of the vaccine program there. In Nigeria and in some parts of the Muslim world, it was these vaccines are here, they will sterilize our children, etc. Right. Or it will give us aid. So we're not unfamiliar with that in yeah. America. So that so that's part of the problem there. But the political will is a way you, where you invest money in. And I think that that's where it's very important, as Paul Farmer really right, rightly pointed out, that human beings move across borders flu fluidly. Infectious disease move across the world. We've seen it with all the, um, the pandemics. We've seen it with uh, Ebola, which is sepsis. Um, but at the borders, because of regulations, therapy stops and humanity stops. So right now what we're seeing in Europe, I was um, there earlier last year, colleagues of mine who work in um, Germany, they were seeing uh, diseases that have not been seen. In fact, they weren't aware of African relapsing fever, etc. And one of the major problems there were multi-drug resistant TB, that it is very difficult for someone who needs uh, treatment for two years, how do you follow these uh, people? So the fact is, with travel, with climate change, we are now seeing dengue and malaria and those things and Zika uh, um, uh, coming up to United States now from Latin America and certain parts of the Caribbean. We have, um, for the first time in the history of mankind, where uh, more people are living in uh, crowded urban areas than in the suburbs, and we are still grappling with, we don't understand diseases right. there. So one it's all political, sort of. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about um, when we were watching this lecture, too, is that even in the United States, it is not a, um, there's some heterogeneity into, uh, into the, the diseases that there are parts of the United States that act very much like low um, income countries. And you were mentioning some data that you were familiar with. About. Absolutely. Both the United States and Canada, which are very wealthy countries, uh, I always think in terms that the inequity is very spiky. And you'll find in the southern United States, some of the outcomes you see among children with sepsis are similar to what we see in sub-Saharan Africa. In northern communities in Canada, we are seeing the very same thing. And some of the lessons we've learned and some that Flavia mentioned about our post-discharge uh, sort of um, interventions in Uganda, we are now using it in uh, Inuit communities and none of it. So I think that right. across the world, we have this spikiness. I wanted to follow up on that. So. I think what you really want us to think about is that uh, disease, uh, infection, sepsis, they're international problems. No, no nation is an island. And there are countries where it becomes a political pawn. So I guess what I would like to have you talk to us about is how to form allies and co collaborations with governments how to do that with NGOs? How, how do people get together as international citizens to try to create change? Yeah, I think that uh, we, we as a Global Sepsis Alliance, of which uh, Dr. Machado is part, we have lobbied for years uh, to get a UN resolution of the World Health Assembly on sepsis as a global threat. Because, as you rightly pointed out, with global travel 
and um, I, I shudder to think the diseases patterns that goes across uh, the world very quickly. Uh, we saw it with SARS in Toronto. So there's an economic implications for countries. In fact, the same as Ebola. Um, I remember vividly in Canada where there was big uh, sort of um, resistance to declaring things because uh, tourism goes down, the economy and those sort of things in countries. Uh, Mm. Uh, thing. So it's a global threat um, uh, with sepsis and with the UN resolution on sepsis now, um, uh, Flavia showed a picture um, at the WHO where we gathered people from all across the world to now decide how to operationalize um, this, this resolution. I think that um, looking at it carefully, what we have been trying to do is build alliances across the world. And with our help, there is now an African Sepsis Alliance because, as she pointed out, the data in Africa is very scanty, but we know that the burden is high and mortality is high. So in, uh, we launched it in Kampala um, late last year and in Sudan just a few weeks ago we were there. And now the Sudanese, uh, the Khartoum Minister of Health, uh, is going to the African Union and trying to bring ministers of health from all the countries to Sudan so they can discuss the issue there. So it's those partnerships that is going to really make uh, um, a difference. But as Sklavi also showed, advocacy, uh, the, uh, the um, intelligence about what is sepsis and those things is very low. And I think we have to get advocacy in high in the thing across the world because the um, uh, CDC in Atlanta, it's only about a year ago that sepsis became uh, big on the website. The WHO only never had it really. They had maternal and newborn sepsis. They now have sepsis as a, it's your website. She mentioned the global burden of disease, the IMA, HME in Washington. We are now trying to ferret out sepsis from the garbage codes that they have there. So getting the data is very important because when we go to governments or when we go to NGOs and even my own hospital and I said, sepsis is an issue, let us deal with it. They said, where's the data? Mm -hmm. And right. right now we don't have the data. So she mentioned the data that was done by Carlin Fleischmann and the group that was published um, looking at the burden of sepsis worldwide. We did a similar study um, looking at um, the burden of sepsis in, in pediatrics. And it's the very same thing, even more scanned data in pediatrics, and it will be released within the next week or two in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. So we have a lot to do to collect the data. And there's a really an, a huge economic burden, too, of yep. sepsis. In fact, um, when we look at sepsis, it's mostly young people, people in the, in the years of their lives where they are very productive um, across the world. In fact, most of these countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, the population, the uh, mean age is something like 20, 25 years. Like in Uganda and those things, half of the population is under 18. So it's young people who are dying. And in fact, Matthew Bond, uh, years ago, um, uh, is a health economist at Harvard, and I'm paraphrasing in ways, but he said that infectious disease is stealing human resources. And that is uh, when we look at disability and quality of life years lost, not only those who die, but 40% of those who survive tend to have disabilities. We, there's a huge economic burden of having and, sepsis. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, Flavia talked about and you talked about as well is that half of the people who have sepsis will die after their hospitalization, that just yep. as many will die post-hospitalization in the first six months as did will, will yep. pass away in the hospital. So what was very interesting, a few years ago, um, uh, the student um, um, uh, postdoc who's in Uganda, we got together and we reviewed the literature and it was buried in the literature, but when you treat someone, we think it's episodic, you treat them and they can go home. But what we found is that the same number of kids we, we looked at were dying within three to six months, and most of them within a few weeks of going home. We don't know what they died from, but 60% of those never made it back to healthcare, and it's because they've lost faith in the system or they did not have yeah, money. It's, it's awful. Wow. So uh, that is a program she was talking about where we uh, sort of develop an app. We hook them up to community health workers, give them a bar of soap to, mm -hmm. to tell them about about hand hygiene, give them a mosquito net. And what we found was that we, they returned to the hospital visits. We were able to decrease mortality and treat many at home. And now we've launched a project in several other hospitals. This makes me want to ask you about the ability to think about post-ICU syndrome mm -hmm. in uh, these countries that have limited healthcare mm -hmm. resources. Yeah. How 
how, how do we even begin to tackle that issue? Right, uh, that, that's a major issue and it's bring it, bringing it to the fore that we're trying to do right now. With the children, we have been able to do that and like any program um, to, for success, uh, we got the government involved very early on and showed them the, the benefits of this program. And now we have a cohort that we're going to be following long term. But it is a major problem even in our world here. We have not really yes. done a good job of the post-ICU care. Especially and in kids. Know, yeah, in kids, we have nothing. And in adults, even the Apache sort of areas that are now waking up to this issue. In fact, 40% of people have a post-ICU problem. There's pain, there's nightmare. It's post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, these yes. individuals. I, I can tell you out the personal story. My father had it, and uh, he didn't realize it until I told him about it. He started yeah. telling me some of these symptoms about yeah. the PTSD he was having from being in the hospital. Yeah, and uh, it can be, it can be quite challenging. Yeah. Um, How do we? Oh, sorry. How do we get allies to advocate for this? For example, this is a huge economic loss. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there is, uh, there are economists out there yeah. who are aware of this. How how do we leverage that into? Mm -hmm a voice that is heard by governments that are worrying about infrastructure, that are worrying about mm -hmm. their next crop, for example. So we, we have to take uh, pages of the experience of others. And I looked at this years ago and wondered, why is cancer known across the world and sepsis isn't? Well, a, a few uh, years ago, um, it was a, a pediatrician in Boston Children's Hospital who took care of cancer, uh, uh, a pathologist who decided they needed something to to do something about cancer. And he really um, sort of thought about it in, in the light that uh, disease is like a political campaign. You need icons, mascots, mm -hmm. you need celebrities. Yeah. You need to fight the disease in the corridors of authority and power yep. to get the finances to fight it at the bedside. And cancer went about that. And they spoke about a disease um, you gotta have, it's like a religion. You gotta have a prophet, a prophecy, a book, and a revelation. For cancer, it came together. The prophet was Mary Lasker, who was the president of cancer thing. The prophecy was, um, we will cure cancer, right? The book was Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he booked the cancer ward. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, um, the revelation was when men went to the moon in 69, they said, we can conquer the heavens. It's here. All came together. And at that time, there were over 450 articles in New York Times in one year on cancer. And Richard Nixon was saying, do you need more money? I think that that's mm -hmm. the thing. So you look at the March yeah. of Dimes. Um, polio became the biggest um, sort of problem in the United States because the president had polio and um, then c citizens went around with the buckets uh, collecting dimes, yeah. et cetera. We need our sepsis moonshot? Yep, yeah, that's what we need. Yeah. Mm. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you um, that we talked about a little bit is if I gave you, I know you've been asked this yeah. question before, if I gave you $5 billion to cure sepsis, yeah. what would you do with that money? I think it's simple. I think when we look at the experience in um, the across the world, when we had the million developmental goals, which was to decrease sepsis, decrease um, uh, mortality in children, etc., women across the world, one of the countries that did very well was Bangladesh, one of the poorest nations there. And one of the factors that really um, raised its head and people uh, looked about was empowerment of women. Okay, um, because of there was the micro loan and the banks and those sort of things, but they took they were better educated, they had uh, money, they can take better care of their children. We look at the United Nations, uh, UNICEF had some data showing that the longer young ladies stayed in school across the world, mortality decreased dramatically for children. So it's an easy question for me. It's really empowering women and keeping young ladies in school for longer periods yeah. of time. So this is something that, as an ICU attending, we're not really used to uh, advocating for these things. You would yeah. not necessarily think that this is something an intensive so care unit physician should be advocating for, well but we're really talking about the basics of public health um, and the yeah. basics of, uh, of, um, of you know, political yeah. activism. Well. Advocacy is in the DNA of every physician, healthcare worker. It's written in all of our constitution and every sort of thing. So it's in our DNA, but we advocate usually for our single patients. 
On the other hand, I think as leaders, the physician leaders, we have to think about uh, within the resource limitations we have advocating for a population base. We do it uh, sort of grudgingly when there is a pandemic or an accident or something and we have to sort of allocate resources in the ICU in different patients. But I think we have to think broader now and say, yes, we have a population. As Flavia made the point very clearly that we need help worldwide. We need to advocate and we need to get a job done. I think that is a perfect place to stop. Dr. Carroll, I'm so glad you asked that question, and thank you so much, Dr. Kassoon, for being here with us. Riveting stuff. Uh, that's all the time we have for this segment. I wish we had more. But our next Critical Connections live broadcast will be at 9.45 a.m. Central Standard Time. It will cover the latest research project from SCCM's Discovery Network. We will be joined by the, lenders, uh, the leaders of the Discovery Network, Dr. Craig Coopersmith and Dr. Ogi Gajic, after the session to learn more about the many research opportunities available through Discovery.